Hey. How you doing? I'm just making a post on uh, the, the 2024 page and then. I'm sorry, hold on. I think you're on mute. Um, am I muted? Can't be. Yeah. Hello? Hmm. Oh, good. Okay. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Yeah. All good. My bad. Sorry. I had it on. I think it was like on mute as well. So. Okay. No. All good. No all good. Yeah. I, I was just. Good. I'm just yeah. making a post for uh, the Med 2024 page now. So okay. the link was just posted. Okay. All good. Um, I'll probably give like a little two minute introduction, then you can. Be... Yeah. Sure. So, would you like me to share my screen, and I can just sort of run it through? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll probably like be muted and like doing something doing some work yeah, in yeah, the background yeah, but if you need anything you can always message and i'll okay. be recording it as well so yeah all oh, good excellent okay i'm all set to go as well so um, all right great right. okay yeah just, yeah we're getting some people oh, okay. that was quick here i think i'll probably wait until about like 10 0 or something. Yeah, yeah. And That's I'll... cool. Um.
All right, hey guys. Uh, that's quite a hefty amount of people for 10 a.m. on a Sunday morning. I uh, hope everyone's doing well, bright, early, and ready. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll just give a little short introduction. So these are just a bunch of revision lectures run by friendly second years. Uh, here we have Kavindi. Uh, you can say hi. <laughs> or you. Hi, hi guys. Nice to meet you. I'm Kavindi. Yep. Yeah. And um, I'll be recording all of this, uh, and I'll put it up on the Google Drive and the Mumus YouTube channel. Um, if you guys have any questions, just pop it in the chat, and then uh, I'll take note of them, and Kevin, you will probably get to them uh, at the end. Or if not, I'll just PM you the answer. Uh, we'll probably just get started. Uh, I'd recommend everybody keeping their uh, mic muted and uh their videos off unless they want to be made like the meme of the whole cohort for the next month but uh yeah all right great uh i'll probably be quiet now and let uh kavindi uh go ahead whenever right. you're ready yeah thanks so much Akil. okay i'm just gonna share my screen guys so just give me a second bear with me oh dear um Akil, i think it says the host has disabled screen sharing oh dear oh I, hold on, let me double check. Yep, I think you should be... Good? Okay, yeah. oh good, thank you. Does it work now? Yeah? Yeah, it's working. All right, great. Yeah, all right. Just bear with me, guys. Okay, yeah. So we can all see it. Just, okay, yeah. Well, not like I can see, but... Okay, yeah, so um, hi guys, thanks so much for tuning in. I know it's pretty early on a Sunday morning, so thanks for joining me. Um, my name is Kavindi, I'm a second year. Uh, yeah, so I hope you guys are kind of somewhat enjoying your first year. I know it's probably a little bit different to how you imagined it, but I hope you're still enjoying your learning and keeping up with the content, hopefully. Um, yeah, so I'm super excited to be kicking off revision lectures for you guys. I'm going to be covering biochem. Um, so hopefully the content is somewhat familiar to you at this point, but that's okay if it isn't. Um, obviously some of you will be more familiar with it if you've done VC or IB biology previously, um, but regardless of where you are on sort of the continuum, um, my aim today is just to give you guys an overview and sort of consolidate some of those key concepts to help you feel a bit more confident um, going into things. So yeah, um, if you have any questions, just chuck them in the chat and hopefully you can check up on that. Um, or you can email me, so I've just um, left my email there for you guys. Um, yeah, I'd also just like to acknowledge that sort of the source of my information was um, my lecture notes from last year um, and that the structure of this lecture is largely based off of last year's um, biochem revision lecture, which was presented by Karthik Sinhal. So I'm just putting that out there and I hope this is useful for you guys. So yeah, just let me know if you need me to slow down or if you have any questions. Um, yeah, I'll get underway. So this is sort of my content coverage, what I'm going to be going through with you guys today. Um, so we're going through cell body fluids, um, cellular energetics, a bit of enzymes, macromolecules, and I'm just touching a little bit on acid-base chemistry. You're going to get to other lectures on genetics and metabolism, so don't worry about that. I'm just kind of filling in the rest of the gaps. Uh, yeah, so I know things are going to be different for you guys in terms of assessment, but sort of like in, well, I was talking in more of an exam context, I guess this stuff is mostly moderate yield. So like in an exam or an assessment, you probably wouldn't get a large number of questions on this kind of material, but I think it definitely is important because these are the kinds of questions that you should be able to get right most of the time um, because it's less sort of involving memory and more to do with understanding. So in that sense, it's pretty easy to capitalize on them if you have a good understanding of the subject matter. So that's really important. Um, yeah, so I'm going to focus um, a bit on the physiology and the enzymes, I think, because that's what you can sort of um, really make the most out of. Um, so yeah, I'll just get going with cells and body fluids. So um, some things you should probably hopefully remember um, what a solute and solvent are. They're the components of a solution. So the solute is what gets dissolved in the solvent in a solution. Um, yeah, and in pretty much all medical, biological sort of scenarios, the solvent is going to be water, which makes sense because humans are mostly made up of water. Um, water is a great solvent. Um, being a polar molecule itself, it readily dissolves other polar molecules, including ionic compounds, stuff like salts. 
Um, yeah, so out of our total body mass, about 60% of that is water. So we say that our total body water, at least for an average human, is about 60%. Um, and that kind of varies depending on gender. So women have a slightly lower water percentage in comparison to men. And that's to do with sort of, I guess, fat composition, because women have more fatty tissues and fatty tissues have a lower water content compared to your lean sort of muscular tissue. Yeah, so as for where all this water is found in the body, so I've got a diagram there. Um, so we like to think of the body as having sort of fluid compartments. So there's the intracellular and the extracellular fluid compartments. So two thirds of the water is going to be in the intracellular fluid compartment. So that's basically intracellular inside of cells. Um, so that's going to be sort of the water that's inside your cell cytoplasms. And then the extracellular fluid, that's going to be made up of 80% interstitial fluid, which is just sort of the sort of the fluid environment outside of cells. So still in the tissues, but all sort of that, that blue area in the diagram. And then the other 20% is going to be in your intravascular compartment. So that's inside of your blood vessels. So that's all good to know. I think it's important when you're thinking about physiology to think about compartments because that's essentially what we're looking at. We're looking at the movement of water and substances across membranes and between compartments. So it's good to have sort of an idea of that big picture. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about um, osmolarity and I guess how it's different to tonicity, but I think it's first important to sort of consider osmolarity by itself so that we understand that. Um, so osmolarity of a solution. So the definition is it's the, basically the total concentration, or if you like, the total count of solutes per unit volume of solvent. So in other words, it's just how many moles of solute, usually per litre of solvent. So hence why the units are osmoles per litre. Um, and generally when we talk about osmolarity, you can basically sort of um, see osmoles as moles. Um, so if you have one mole of solute, for example, that gets dissolved in one litre of solvent, you're going to have an osmolarity of one osmol per litre, um, generally. So that's what generally happens. Where this slightly sort of differs is when you have compounds that dissociate. So that means they kind of, for example, um, things like sodium chloride. So that's what I've sort of put as an example. So if you have um, compounds that dissociate, so they break down um, like sodium chloride, um, then you have to sort of consider the, the different ions as their own separate solutes. So in the red at the bottom there, when you have one mole of aqueous sodium chloride getting dissolved into a litre of water, you're going to have one mole of sodium ions plus one mole of chloride ions. So overall, there's going to be two moles of solute in that one litre. And as a result, you're going to have two osmoles per litre as the osmolarity. Um, so that's basically what osmolarity is. Um, so then the sort of looking at tonicity, I guess. Um, oh, I also wanted to mention that, so in questions, they'll provide you with a dissociation constant. And what that will be is just a percentage of the substance that is going to dissociate. So meaning that the rest of the substance won't dissociate. So you have to take that into consideration when you're doing calculations. So I have a question later on that we can look at as well. Um, but yeah, sorry, going back to tonicity. So it's different in that it's only counting non-diffusible solute particles. So it's just those non-diffusibles. Um, yeah, so that's what's different. So because of that, we're considering and making a differentiation between the solutes that can and can't diffuse across a membrane. And because of that, tonicity is kind of membrane dependent, I guess, because the membrane is what's going to determine, sorry, what um, will and won't diffuse through it. Um, yeah, so just a little bit more about that membrane permeability. So tonicity is membrane dependent. And in most cases, I guess we're, we're just considering our classic lipid bilayer. So I thought I'd put some information in about what can and can't pass through that. So the ones you should probably be paying attention to are sort of sodium and potassium. So these ones, we like to say that they're effectively non-diffusible or the membrane is effectively impermeable to them. So they don't really pass through or at least that's how we like to think of them. So in reality, they do pass through, but um, because of the protein, so the sodium potassium protein pumps that they have on the membrane, those guys are in charge of sort of maintaining quite strictly the intracellular concentrations of these ions. So even when they do pass through, they kind of get kicked back out. So largely we just think of them as being non-diffusible. Yeah, and the other one you should probably remember is urea. So that one is just definitely diffusible across the membrane.
Yeah, so then we'll just talk a little bit about osmosis. Um, so it would probably be good to know the definition. So it's just the passive movement. So that means no energy required of water molecules from a region of low solute concentration to a region of high solute concentration across the semipermeable membrane. Yes, yeah, so I have written down that the process is influenced by tonicity. Um, so Yes, so the water moves towards the, um, the sort of compartment or the side of the membrane that is containing solution with a higher tonicity, as you can see in the diagram there. So the water is moving to the side where there is more of those non-diffusible sugar molecules, which you can see are the red ones. So the water sort of moves towards the right hand side in that diagram. So why does that happen? That's because, um, so if you think about diffusible solutes, so we know they're able to diffuse across the membrane. And as a result of that, they will be able to disperse themselves and sort of establish an equilibrium across both sides of the membrane. So they're gonna balance themselves out nicely between um, the two compartments. Um, on the other hand, our non-diffusables, they're not going to be able to do that because they can't cross the membrane. So as a result, they're going to stick to one side and they're going to create that solute imbalance. And that's what's going to cause um, or result in that concentration gradient where one side has a higher solute concentration. And so that's what's going to draw the water across the membrane. So that's why it's really the non-diffusables that are having sort of an influence on the water movement in osmosis. Yeah, so that's an important point. We're looking at tonicity with osmosis. Um, yeah, so just moving on, these are sort of the types of exam questions you're gonna get, or well, um, that we got, um, are just basically scenarios where we have red blood cells in different solutions. So I've kind of tucked in a diagram so you can see sort of what happens with various types of solutions. So you're mostly gonna be concerned with the tonicity, as we mentioned, because we discussed that previously. So, um, First of all, probably a good thing to know is that the tonicity of a red blood cell is 300 milliosmoles per litre. So that's probably a good thing for you to remember. And when I say red blood cell, I basically just mean the cytoplasm of the red blood cell. So that inside the cell is 300 milliosmoles per litre. Um, some really common solutions you should probably sort of know about are saline. So saline is 0.9% sodium chloride. So that's your normal saline solution. And your dextrose, so you've probably heard of that, that's a 5% sugar solution. So those are, I guess, technically speaking, those are your isotonic solutions. And we'll talk a little bit more about dextrose later. Um, so those are isotonic. The hypertonic solutions being just your plain water and your isotonic urea. Um, so what happens is if you put red blood cells in a hypertonic ECF, so the ECF, um so like the, the fluid outside of the cell is hypertonic, having a higher tonicity, the water is going to move out of the cells and that's going to result in the cells shriveling up. Like you can see on the left hand side, that's called cremation. If you have an isotonic ECF and you place red blood cells in there, there's going to be no net water movement because there's an equal tonicity inside and outside of the cell. And then lastly, if you put red blood cells inside of a hypotonic ECF, the water is going to move into the cells because the cells will, relative to um, the outside liquid, be hypertonic. They'll have a higher tonicity. So that's going to cause water to move in and cause the cells to burst. And so the term for that is cytolysis. And if you're talking specifically about a red blood cell, we can call it hemolysis as well. Um, yeah, so I just mentioned a little bit about osmotic pressure because I saw that it got put in with some of your graded questions, but I don't think it was a huge thing for us in exams, at least. But um, just to know what it is, it is basically osmotic pressure is the pressure that's required to prevent a solvent from crossing that membrane and entering that solution by osmosis. So you can see in the diagram there, um, the pressure that's being applied on the right hand side to stop the water from moving across the membrane into that area, that region of higher solute concentration. Um, so you can imagine that if you have a larger number of solute particles, so there's orange things, if you have more of those, there's gonna be a larger concentration gradient. So you're gonna get more water flowing across that membrane. So a higher magnitude of water movement, and that's gonna require a higher pressure to sort of push that down. So therefore osmotic pressure is a colligative property. And what that means is that it's dependent on the number of particles in the solution. Yeah, and osmotic pressure can be calculated as well using Van Hoff's law. So I've just put that there. I don't think it's 
it's not a huge thing, but I thought I'd just mention that so that you um, you sort of have that knowledge there for you. But I'm not going to go through it today. It's that's okay. Um, yeah, so this is sort of the exam question that I was talking about. So you're, you're just going to get um, a red blood cell that's placed in some solution. Um, and you sort of have to work out what's going to happen, predict the direction of water movement. So an important assumption that you have to make make with all of these scenarios is, is that the bath is going to be so large that um, sort of the amount of water that diffuses in and out of that cell is going to have pretty much no impact on the concentration of the solution inside the bath just because um, the blood cell is so infinitely small compared to the water. So actually in hindsight this diagram is not to scale so it'll be a lot smaller. So as a result the concentration changes are going to be really minuscule so it's not going to matter too much. Um, but yeah, I just thought I'd go through an example with you. So this is sort of the one that I've done. Um, so this is a red blood cell in 1.8% urea solution. So I thought I'd go through this one. I think it's a good example that illustrates why diffusibles don't really matter in osmosis. And it's really um, just the concentration of non-diffusibles or the tonicity that's going to govern that water movement. Um, so yeah, this is probably a table you've seen in your lectures as well, your physiology lectures. So I've just kind of done my own version. So I have the intracellular fluid, that's the stuff inside the red blood cell on the left-hand side, and your urea solution on the right-hand side. So we actually start off with an initial osmolarity of 300 on both sides. But so where the difference is that inside the cell, in the red blood cell, all of that um, all that solute is non-diffusible. So that's going to stay in the cell throughout um, the whole time, I guess. And in the urea solution, urea, as we talked about, is diffusible. So it is able to cross the membrane. So that's what's going to um, move across in this next step. So first we should factor in what happens with the diffusibles. So um, the 300 inside the red blood cell is going to stay inside the red blood cell. But in on sort of the urea side, the urea will diffuse across. So you're going to get that solute moving into the red blood cell as well. Um, but as we discussed, because the urea bath is so big, um, the change to the osmolarity on sort of inside the bath itself is not going to be very big. So it's actually going to be pretty much nothing at all because the red blood cell is so small. So really the osmolarity of the bath will not change, as we can see. So the resultant osmolarity is still 300 in the urea bath just because it's so huge. Um, but in the red blood cell, on the other hand, because that urea has diffused across, you're going to get 300 non-diffusibles that were staying in there from originally, plus the 300 diffusibles that came across with the urea. So a total of 600 milliosmoles per litre is the new osmolarity inside of the red blood cell. So then we have to look at the difference in sort of particles, yeah, to work out where our concentration gradient is. And so there's a higher solute concentration overall in the intracellular fluid and as a result water is going to move into the cell and that's going to cause hemolysis. So that's sort of the whole sort of laboured um, process of it but really if you just look at the tonicity like we discussed because that's what's going to be sort of the driving factor for osmosis. If you just look at the difference in tonicity initially there was 300 in the uh, intracellular fluid and then zero in the bath. So that would have given you the indication of the direction of water movement without looking at the diffusibles and sort of factoring that in. So you can do that as a shortcut. Just look at the tonicity and then use that to work out the direction of water movement. Yeah, so that's going to result in hemolysis. Yes, so I just wanted to talk about that. Um, yeah, and while we're at it, I just wanted to mention that iso, it's probably obvious, but um, I just wanted to make a point of it, that isoosmolar is not equal to isotonic. So those two words are not interchangeable. Um, and yeah, because tonicity considers whether the solution and the solute, sorry, are diffusible or non-diffusible. So you've got that element of discrimination, whereas osmolarity doesn't take that into account. It's just all the solutes. So as a result, you can have isoosmolar solutions that may not be isotonic. So the example we just did with urea, urea is isoosmolar, but it's not isotonic as we just saw. And similarly, isotonic solutions may not be isoosmolar. So that's just something to sort of be mindful of, I guess. Um, in terms of clinical applications of 
um, sort of these solutions. So where does this sort of apply or how can we see sort of the clinical relevance? So I'm going to talk a bit about isotonic solutions. So the two that you should probably know are that normal saline solution and that 5% dextrose solution. So um, where are they used clinically and why do we use them, I guess? So these are given intravenously to patients as a means of fluid replacement. So that's how we replace lost fluids um, in sort of dehydrated patients. Um, we give them IV hydration. So, and also I guess with the dextrose, because it's a sugar solution, so that will also provide carbohydrates to the body. So that's a way of increasing a person's blood sugar levels actually as well. Um, but largely it's for fluid, fluid replacement, sorry. So when you, first of all, actually, why don't we um, just give water? Why don't we just um, administer water actually? So I don't know if you guys want to answer in the chat. Um, or whatnot, but I, I was just going to talk through it, I guess. So if we do give somebody pure water, so that's going to be a high photonic solution as we talked about. So what will happen then is if you imagine giving that into the blood, um, you're going to have the cells are going to be hypertonic to the solution that we're giving. And as a result, the water will just move straight into the cells across that concentration gradient, yeah? So then um, the cells are just going to fill up with all that water and they're going to burst. So we're going to get cytolysis. So that's a bad thing, and that's why we don't just straight away give water. We give isotonic solutions so that the water doesn't move across immediately. Yeah, so um, with the case of normal saline, so because we're giving an isotonic solution, it's just going to go into the extracellular fluid and it's going to stay in the ECF. So yeah, we give that to increase the ECF because sodium is effectively impermeable. It's not going to cross the membrane, so it won't enter the cells, and thus the water will stay in the ECF. Dextrose, on the other hand, so what happens is a little bit different. So the water will initially stay in the ECF, but as we know, sugar in the body, over time, it'll get metabolized. So the sugar concentration will therefore decrease over time. And so gradually, our tonicity is also going to decrease. And so what's going to happen is just slowly over time, the cells will become hypertonic eventually and the water will start moving across into the cells. But that's going to happen so gradually that it's not going to cause the cells to burst. Um, so instead of saying that um, dextrose increases the ECF, we rather would say that it overall increases the total body water because we do have water going into the cells as well. So that's sort of the clinical relevance of of isotonic solutions. I just wanted to talk about that. And what I have here for you guys, just quickly, is a summary of all of that information. So all of those um, red blood cell in solution scenarios and also the clinical sort of relevance scenarios. So you can sort of go over that in your own time, um, just as a quick summary. I also wanted to mention cellular ion concentrations. So that's not particularly relevant to the physiology that we just discussed, but I thought it was useful to know sort of um, which ones have higher concentrations inside versus outside. So sodium, there's more sodium outside of cells, there's more chloride outside of cells, and there's more calcium outside of cells. But potassium, on the other hand, has a higher intracellular concentration. Um, and you've also got all those negatively charged proteins inside of the cell, which is what makes sort of, um, I guess, the charge inside the cell um, more negative relative to the outside of the cell. So I thought that was important to mention, but it's not particularly relevant to what we're discussing at the moment. Yeah, so I just have some questions, but I think just in the interest of time, we might just skip through these and hopefully if we have time at the end, I'll come back to them. If that's okay, I just think, so just try not to look at the answers actually. Um, but yeah, um, just so that we get through all the content. So um, now we're into cellular energetics and enzymes. So I'll just discuss that with you guys. And this is just some basic sort of stuff to, I guess, understand. You don't need to know this off by heart or anything by any means, but just understand that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. You probably know this from like physics in high school. Um, that's the law of conservation of energy. So you can't create it, can't destroy it. It is instead converted from one form to another. So AKA energy transformations. Um, and of course, in that process, some of the energy will get lost and become unavailable to do work. So in other words, these transformations are not completely efficient. So that's just good to know and understand, I think. Um, yeah, so talking about endergonic and exergonic um, reactions, this is probably like a throwback to your VCE chemistry <laughs> a little bit. 
Um, so you probably know a lot about these. I just sort of thought I'd do a summary slide um, about the differences. So um, obviously all our reactions in the body can be categorized as either exergonic or endergonic. Um, so exergonic reactions are those catabolic reactions. So they're involved in sort of the breakdown, I guess, so breaking down substances into smaller sort of products. Um, and your anabolic reactions are your antagonic reactions. So those are the building synthesis reactions. Um, so differences, what are the differences? So I guess catabolic exergonic reactions are spontaneous. So that means basically in like normal conditions, I guess, um, the reaction favors the formation of the product. So they go ahead spontaneously and they release energy. Um, whereas with your endergonic reactions, they are non-spontaneous and they do the opposite. So they take up, consume energy, absorb energy. Um, another important point of difference between these two reaction types is the change in free energy. So I put that at the bottom. So how you calculate that, um, which you probably might have to in sort of some of your assessments, will be sort of calculating the difference between the energy of the products and the energy of the reactants. So you just find those two numbers and then subtract them. So I think that's pretty simple. Um, but that's a point of difference between these two types of reactions. Because as you can see in the endergonic reactions, so the products have um, a higher level of energy than the reactants. And as a result, um, we can see that the change in free energy will be positive and vice versa for exergonic reactions. The products um, have a lower level of energy than the reactants. So as a result, your difference so is going to be negative. Um, yeah, I hope that makes sense. Um, and so an example of an exergonic reaction is a hydrolysis reaction. That's a very common type of exergonic reaction. And your con condensation reaction, sorry, are your endergonic reactions. So that's an example of an endergonic reaction. Yeah, so I thought I'd also talk a little bit about ATP. So um, yeah, I guess it's important to understand its function in the body. Um, we often call it the energy currency of the body. So it's like a storage, um, molecule for energy, I guess. It's where energy can get stored. Um, and really where that energy gets stored is in that high energy phosphate bond. So you can sort of, um, I guess, you know, um, ADP plus that inorganic phosphate, um, they combine to get converted into ATP. So that terminal, um, that bond between that terminal phosphate group and that, well, what was previously that ADP molecule, that bond is where all that energy gets stored. Um, and as it's required, you can break down ATP or hydrolyze it um, to release that energy. So that's what's sort of happening in this diagram here. We have, so on the top left-hand corner, you've got your exergonic reactions that are happening in the body, releasing that energy. Um, and then what will happen is um, that endergonic reaction, which is the conversion of ADP to ATP, will take place. And all of that energy, um, from those exergonic reactions will be stored inside of that high energy phosphate bond. Um, and so that will stay in the body. And then as it's needed, ATP can get hydrolyzed to release that energy from that bond so that it can go forth and be used in endergonic reactions as they're required in the body. So that's how ATP sort of works to store energy and to transfer energy in the body. Um, yeah, so now I'm just going to talk a little bit about enzymes, I guess. So um, hopefully for all you bio kids, this is um, pretty familiar territory. So um, well, we'll go through it. So enzymes are protein molecules that act as biological catalysts. So that means that they increase the rate of chemical reactions. Yeah, so important to remember they don't get consumed in the reaction itself. So they're just kind of like a tool that you use. Um, uh, I didn't actually write this down in the slide, but it is important to know that they are substrate specific. So the enzyme kind of works specific to a particular substrate. So it has a function um, specific to the, the substrate, sorry. So um, yeah, I didn't put a diagram of this, but um, we probably discussed in lectures and whatnot, the lock and key model. So this is kind of what's happening in the diagram that I've shown. So you have the shape of the enzyme's active site is complementary to the shape of the substrate molecule. So that's what we kind of used to believe, but there is sort of another more common theory these days um, called the induced fit model. So you might know a bit about that as well. So that's more so like the enzyme is semi-specific, so it's kind of like the shape of the substrate, but it's more that when the substrate comes into contact with 
um, the enzyme that it's sort of specific for, the enzyme will sort of mold itself against the substrate molecule to become complementary, more so than they're, they kind of just fit like a lock and key. So that's kind of the more widely accepted sort of theory now. Um, so yeah, that's relevant. And also enzymes, it's important to remember they they kind of, they're picky, they function under specific environmental conditions. So at particular temperatures or um, in specific pH environments. Yeah, so I just have an example there of how an enzyme acts. Um, yeah, so sort of a, a little bit of a, a prelude before your macromolecules. I talk about macromolecules. So you'll, this is a, the substrate being a sucrose molecule which is a disaccharide that's getting broken down into its components of glucose and fructose um, by this enzyme, which um, is called sucrase. So that um, the suffix "ase," you'll get that a lot in catabolic enzymes that sort of break stuff down. Um, so yeah, that's sort of um, a flag to indicate that they break something down. And then the rest of the name will generally indicate what is being broken down in that enzyme reaction. Yeah, so just a little bit about enzymes in action. So there's lots of different ways that enzymes can sort of do their job. They might change the orientation of substrates to facilitate a reaction. So, or they might apply physical strain to a substrate. They might change electrical charges within a substrate. So there's lots of different ways that they can act. Um, on the left-hand side, I've just got a diagram to sort of show how, um, how increasing the concentration of substrate will impact sort of enzyme activity. So um, at the start, um, yes, yeah, so increasing the substrate will increase the reaction rate because then you've got sort of more substrate to interact with enzymes. So then the, um, the activity sort of, I guess, or the reaction rate will increase up to a certain point. So you'll reach a maximum rate. Um, and the reason that you have kind of that cap Point where there's a maximum rate is because eventually you'll have all of the enzyme molecules being occupied. So just adding more substrate won't do anything because they have nowhere to go, I guess. So that's why you do get a maximum sort of rate there. Um, yeah, I just wanted to bring that to your attention as well. Um, but yeah, so this, I just wanted to talk about how they work, I guess, how enzymes work. This is important. So they increase reaction rates by lowering the activation energy. Um, so you can sort of see that in green. And they do this by providing an alternative reaction pathway. So it's kind of probably good to know that it comes up a lot in MCQs. Um, so that's helpful. Um, yeah, so, and I put down the definition of an activation energy. So it is the minimum amount of energy required by reactants in order for a reaction to take place. So you do need a little bit of energy for the reaction to actually start, whether it's endogonic or exogonic, um, both have an activation energy. So yeah, you can see that with the enzyme, there's a much lower sort of bar that needs to be reached before the reaction can take place. So that's what an enzyme will do. They'll lower that activation energy. Yeah. Um, yeah, and um, just an important note that enzyme activity doesn't have any impact on the change in free energy. So that was that delta G that we discussed. So that does not get changed um, by an enzyme. So that stays the same, regardless of whether an enzyme is used or not. So the overall energy that is released or consumed during the reaction stays the same. So that's important to remember. Uh, yeah, so I talked a little bit about this. There are some factors that sort of impact the functioning of an enzyme. So one of them being probably the two main ones are temperature and pH. So um, temperature wise, um, they generally function at an optimum temperature, which varies um, quite widely depending on the enzyme. But one thing for sure, um, they can't function very well at high temperatures. The reason being that enzymes are protein molecules, as we said, so they will undergo denaturation at high temperatures. So they don't really work well in high temperatures. Optimal, T, um, sorry, TH. Optimal pH um, varies quite greatly between enzymes and I guess it kind of depends on their function as well. Um, sort of what pH values they function best at. So for example, you've got pepsin right there at the very end. So they function um, at quite a low pH. And the reason for that being it's um, it's sort of, it, um, it's an enzyme that's sort of in the stomach. So it needs to be sort of um, working in that low pH environment. So it kind of just depends on the function of the enzyme as well. So what sort of pH ranges they function optimally in. 
So that can vary quite a bit, but definitely high temperatures, that's gonna impact the function of an enzyme. And yeah, so I'd also like to talk a little bit about enzyme partner molecules. So this isn't a huge thing, but it is good to know sort of the difference. So partner molecules, they kind of, I guess they help the enzyme a little bit. So they're kind of um, little add-on sort of fixtures that come and attach to an enzyme to help the enzyme carry out its function. So you have prosthetic groups, inorganic cofactors, and coenzymes. So your prosthetic groups are permanently bound to the enzyme, and so are your inorganic cofactors. It's the coenzymes that are kind of more loosely bound. So they're not permanently fixed to an enzyme. They rather sort of tend to move between enzymes. Um, and so what they kind of do is they add and remove chemical groups. Um, and in fact, unlike sort of the enzyme itself, they can be changed by the reaction. So that's an important point to remember about coenzymes. Yeah, and I've just got some diagrams. Um, here to sort of explain that. So you've got a prosthetic group on the leftmost side. So there the prosthetic group gets permanently attached. That doesn't move around. Whereas the coenzyme is kind of detachable. It can move around between enzymes. Um, yeah, so I just have some terminology on sort of the right hand side as well. So you've got your sort of coenzyme and then um, the enzyme when it's not bound to the coenzyme is called the apoenzyme. And then once the coenzyme goes and binds to that enzyme, it becomes a complex called a hollow enzyme. So that's just a bit of terminology. I don't think it's overly relevant, but it's good to know. So I thought I'd put that in there for you. Yeah, so we're gonna talk a little about um, enzyme inhibition as well. So hopefully um, this will sort of clear it up and help you sort of remember the different mechanisms. So we've got like three overall mechanisms, competitive, non-competitive, and uncompetitive. And then you've lastly got your negative feedback pathway, which we'll talk a bit about as well. So here's your nice color-coded diagram to help you sort of remember what, how each of them work, I guess. I'll go into a bit more detail about each one. So you've got your competitive inhibition. So this is the one where um, your inhibitor molecule binds directly to the active site of the enzyme. So it takes up that space and competes directly with those substrate molecules to occupy that active site space. So it's kind of like a game of musical chairs, who gets there first. So that's how they kind of prevent um, the reaction from taking place by occupying that space where substrates would be able to bind more. Um, so an important note that sort of sets competitive inhibition apart from other modes of inhibition is that you're able to overcome the effects of competitive inhibitors by increasing the substrate concentration. So um, you can imagine if you just overwhelm um, the inhibitors with sort of substrate, then they're going to become un, um, outnumbered. So that's going to sort of take away from the effect that competitive inhibitors can have in that environment. So yeah, that's the way to um, sort of do away with competitive inhibition. You would increase the substrate concentration. So that's an important um, differentiation. Um, next, talking a little bit about non-competitive inhibition. So this is different to competitive inhibition. So they don't go and bind um, directly to the active site. Instead, they bind to just a site that is not the active site, and that's called the allosteric site. So sometimes you'll see non-competitive inhibition called allosteric inhibition for that reason. So those two are the same. So it binds to some other active site um, and that will change the protein's conformation. So it'll change the shape of that active site. So it's no longer able to bind to the substrate molecule. Yeah, and so because of that, it's got nothing to do with um, sort of occupying the active site itself. And as a result of that, you can't sort of overcome the effect of this type of inhibition just by increasing the substrate concentration. Yeah, and then lastly, we have uncompetitive inhibition. So this doesn't, they don't really interact with so much the active site or another site. They rather sort of bind to the enzyme substrate complex itself. And they, yeah, so they attach to the substrate after it is bound to the active site and just block the release of the product. So they stop the product from getting released. Um, yeah, just in the chat. Um, how can non-competitive inhibition be overcome then? Okay, so um, not really sure to be honest. Like uh, we haven't really discussed 
um, that, I guess. So I guess the point I'm sort of making is that there isn't sort of a way to overcome that. So it's probably the more potent um, way of um, inhibiting enzymes. Is it Savannah? Savannah? Yeah, so that's how that kind of works. So unlike competitive inhibition, this one is a little bit harder to overcome, actually. Um, I can't think of any ways off the top of my head, not that we've learned. I can have a look and get back to you, but um, I think the main point for you to sort of understand is that, um, yeah, more so than what other ways can overcome it, the fact that it can't be overcome by increasing substrate concentration is the more important point. Was that helpful? Um, sorry, I kind of, um, doesn't really matter, but um, yes, okay. <laughs> thanks so much. Yeah, thanks so much for your question. So guys, keep asking questions if you have issues or sort of, I know you're wondering extra information. That's really good. I like to see that. So thanks so much for your question. Um, yeah, so I might have a look into that then and I might get back to you. We'll see how we go. But yeah, thanks for asking that. Um, so yeah. And so you can imagine the same thing with uncompetitive inhibition, just like non-competitive. So because it's not interacting directly with that active site, you're not going to be able to um, overcome the effects of an uncompetitive inhibitor either by increasing that substrate concentration. So that's only going to work if you have competitive inhibition. Yeah. So that's sort of those three mechanisms. And then you've kind of got this additional one the negative feedback pathway. So this is kind of something that happens with um, enzyme mediated pathway. So I think it's best explained using the diagram, I guess, if we just have a look at the diagram. Um, so it's like a pathway of different substrates being converted. Um, and then so the last one being D, this is the end product. So this is also called end product inhibition. So it's basically when you get like an adequate concentration of this end product. And so eventually some of it diffuses across to sort of, I guess, the first area of the pathway. And so this end product also doubles as a non-competitive inhibitor for that first enzyme that converts A to B. So it'll sort of um, lock in place here and prevent um, the reaction from A to B taking place. So therefore this whole pathway is stopped because of um, that. So the end product, once there's enough of that, it'll just come in and stop that reaction from happening. So no more of it gets produced. Yeah, so that's sort of how that works. It kind of halts its own production. It sort of self-manages in that way. So yeah, that's important. That's going to be allosteric inhibition or um, non-competitive inhibition happening over there. Yeah. Um, so just more questions. Hopefully we'll get to come back to these at the end, um, but just in the interest of time. I just want to make sure I get through the content first. So that was all the enzyme stuff. So I'm now just going to sort of briefly talk about macromolecules, and this will be a sort of a nice segue into metabolism. So uh, there are four types of biomacromolecules, so you'll probably be familiar with them. Um, there's carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. So first I'm talking about carbohydrates. So these are, you probably remember, they're compounds made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and the hydrogen and oxygen is present in a ratio of two to one. So that's one way to sort of identify carbohydrate molecules, I guess, if you're looking at a formula. Um, yeah, and they can be classified based on their chemical structure. And by chemical structure, what I basically mean is how many of those monomer units are being sort of um, connected together. So we have our basic monosaccharides. Those are our just, just, just single basic units. So they're just standalone molecules. So probably the most popular one that you would know is glucose. There's also fructose and galactose. So all those are your monosaccharides. And then you've got your disaccharides, which are combinations. So they're two joined monomers that are joined together um, by glycosidic bonding. So we'll talk a bit about that later. But yeah, so main thing, two monomers is disaccharides. Um, common one is sucrose. So we sort of saw that in that enzyme reaction before. So that's made up of a glucose and a fructose that's been joined together. The last two are oligosaccharides and polysaccharides. So basically they just have more than two monomers. I think, and polysaccharides have just a greater number of monomers in general versus oligosaccharides. So I guess the numerical sort of distinction of like how many monomers can um, sort of constitute an oligosaccharide versus polysaccharide, uh, it varies a lot depending on sort of what textbook you look at and what source you're looking at. So I don't think that's particularly important. I just wanted to make you sort of familiar with the word oligosaccharide, but sometimes it's not even used. So really just um, remembering polysaccharides is sort of three or more. 
is probably the way to go there. So there's some examples there of different types of carbs and how they're sort of classified. Um, and this is sort of a more diagrammatic sort of overlook. So you can see they're very, they're quite diverse. And so that's what you can sort of see through this. And you can also see that glycosidic bonding that I mentioned. So all of these sort of monomer units are gonna be connected through glycosidic bonding. So there's two types of bonds that you can see here. So you might have um, touched on this in um, year 12 sort of chem as well. So this is your alpha glycosidic bond and this is your beta glycosidic bond. So yeah, um, we'll have a look at those as well. Um, but first I just wanted to sort of talk about polysaccharides. So the two that we're sort of concerned with in sort of like a, a human biological context are gonna be your starch and glycogen. So that's the ones that you're sort of, um, we're looking at primarily. So your starch is, there's two types of starch, amylose and amylopectin. So amylose is gonna be your linear sort of polysaccharide. So they're actually quite, they're unbranched. So you won't see any branching, they're just kind of a long chain there. So they're your linear ones and amylopectin is kind of branched every once in a while. So we say it's occasionally branched. So that's your amylopectin. So I like to think of it as like, cause amylose is a shorter word, right? So it's less complicated, it's just linear. And then you have your glycogen up the top here. So that's like really, really branched. So it's probably more structurally similar to amylopectin, but yeah, so it's really just highly branched. It's a highly branched polysaccharide. Um, and just talking a little bit more about that bonding. So we're going back to sort of um, discussing the difference between al alpha glycosidic and beta glycosidic. That's not particularly important, but it is good to know that there are two types. Um, it's probably better to sort of know the type of bonding occurring within polysaccharide molecules. So um, just with your amylose, so um, amylose, we talked about how it's unbranched. So it's just gonna be a main chain, just a single main chain. And all of those sort of linear linkages, they're going to be connected through alpha one, four glycosidic bonds. So that's what's um, sort of doing all that main chain linkage. And then, with branches, so where we have branches, so we have branches in amylopectin, and if you can also remember, there's branching in glycogen as well. So where we have branching happening, that's gonna be an alpha 1,6 glycosidic bond. So you can imagine with amylopectin, you're gonna have a mix of 1,4 and 1,6 glycosidic bonds happening in this molecule. And yeah, and more of these 1,6 bonds, even more in your glycogen. So that's sort of important to sort of understand. And it's just good to remember the type of bonding that's occurring. Um, yeah, I hope that's clear. Uh, I'm gonna also talk a little bit about lipids. So there's three types of lipids or main classes that you'd probably be familiar with. So you've got your triacylglycerols or triglycerides, there's a couple of names for them. TAGs is like a short form. Um, yeah, so what those are, uh, they're basically a glycerol molecule and that's undergone a condensation reaction. So for each of its three hydroxyl groups on that glycerol molecule, you're gonna have a fatty chain, um, a fatty acid chain attached to it. So it almost looks like an egg shape, like a really long egg shape. That's your tags, they're formed through those condensation reactions. They're a primary form of energy storage in mammals, and they're a major dietary source of lipids. So that's probably your main one that you're sort of seeing in your body. Um, you're probably already familiar with phospholipids. So those are, um, um, a very important cell membrane component. Yes, so they have that, I'll, I have diagrams later, um, so I'll show you those in a minute. Um, but they're consisting of a phosphate head with your two fatty acid chains. So they're actually quite um, structurally similar to the tags, and I'll show you how in a minute. Um, but so you've got your hydrophilic head, the phosphate head, and then your lipophilic fatty acid chain tails. So that's what makes it ambiphilic. So it's got um, a hydrophilic bit and a hydrophobic bit. Um, which is what enables it to form that lipid bilayer, actually. So it's quite important, that feature of the phospholipid molecule. Probably the most important part about that. Um, and then you've also got steroids. So those are quite structurally different to the other two. So they're kind of, um, you'll be able to pick them out based on their four fused hydrocarbon rings. So they look quite different. Um, and they're the precursors for your steroid hormones, your bile acids, and your um, vitamin D. Um, they are also a cell membrane component. Um, and they are in charge of, in, well, not really, but like maintaining the fluidity of the membrane. So that's a huge buzzword. So if you see anything in a question about membrane fluidity, like maintaining fluidity of a membrane, that's your steroids. So keep an eye out for that. That's a huge buzzword there, fluidity. 
Um, yeah, so these were the diagrams that I was talking about. So you can see that E-shaped triglyceride. So those hydroxyl groups have um, undergone condensation reactions to connect to those fatty acid chains. So it's forming that sort of E-shape. Um, you've got your phospholipid. So this is almost like a tag, but basically instead of that third fatty acid chain, what you've got is a phosphate head attached to it. So they're actually quite structurally similar. And then you've got your odd one out, which is the steroid. So you can see those four fused rings. Yeah, and just a little bit about protein. So I don't think we need to go too much into it, but I'm sure you already know they're very functionally diverse. So they have a lot of different functions in the body from just your structural support. So they're kind of those fibers, sort of collagen elastin, making up your connective tissues. Um, I can't remember if you've gone through that, but so uh, you'll come to see that uh, quite a large component of sort of structure of cells. Um, involved in contractile sort of movement. So you've got your actin and myosin filaments. So you might learn about sliding filament theory in the future. So they're important for your movement, sort of your muscle movements. Um, we've already talked about enzymes, so you should know about those. Um, those are proteins and hormones. So you have some protein hormones and receptors. So that's gonna have a role in cellular communication. Um, of course, your gene regulation. So what's sort of regulating that expression of genes, if you think about, um, I know you've done central dogma, so transcription factors, those are proteins, so things that regulate gene expression, so proteins have a role in that. Um, there are also transport proteins, so if you think about your hemoglobin here, they've shown that, so that's moving your oxygen around the body, that's, um, that's done by a protein. You also, of course, you have your transmembrane proteins, if you think back to your lipid bilayer. So you've got those channel and carrier proteins that are enabling sort of the movement of substances across membranes. So that's also an important function. And you probably haven't done too much about immunology, but um, so those of you who've done biology will sort of know about the antibody responses, complement proteins and all of that. And um, proteins have a large role in um, sort of um, maintaining sort of, or, defending the body, I guess, immunological defense. So there's a lot, um, they're very diverse in terms of their function. Um, and I also just wanted to talk a little bit about the structure of proteins. So this might be familiar to some of you again. Um, so your primary structure of proteins. So we're just starting at the most basic level here. So that's just your linear sequence of amino acids forming that polypeptide chain. So your amino acids are connected by peptide bonds. So this is also a condensation reaction, yeah, because a water molecule gets produced here. So that's what happens to form that peptide bond um, between amino acids. So that's just your primary protein structure. And it's probably important to note that um, when proteins undergo denaturation, all of the other sort of weaker bonding will sort of dissolve or like um, break away and be disrupted. Um, and that's what's going to cause the denaturation. But uh, this this level of protein structure, so the polypeptide chain and those that peptide bonding, that's probably the only part that's not going to be affected. So that's not going to be broken or interfered with when a protein denatures, actually. So that just speaks to the strength of that bond. Uh, yeah, so your secondary protein structure. So those are the folded structures within the polypeptide chain. So you probably are familiar with your alpha helices and your beta sheets your beta pleated sheets. So that's all happening because of interactions within the polypeptide backbone. So what the polypeptide backbone is basically in your polypeptide chain. So in your amino acids, you've got your R group and you've got pretty much everything else. So interactions between sort of atoms within the sort of everything else except the R group, that's all, um, yeah, that's what's going to be contributing to that secondary structure formation. So all those interactions um, in areas not involving the R group, that's what's gonna cause your secondary structure. So when we get to R groups, that's sort of more tertiary structure. So all those interactions between the R groups of amino acids, as you can see, so they're coming off sort of the chain there and having interactions, that's what creates that three-dimensional structure, or we like to call it conformation of the polypeptide chain. So we've got three main types of interactions happening. So you can see some ionic bonding happening between the R groups. That's gonna um, contribute to the shape of the, um, the protein. You've got hydrogen bonding. There's also gonna be disulfide bridge formation and also some hydrophobic interactions, which will include like dispersion forces, van der Waal interaction and whatnot. So that's all gonna be contributing to that shape of the protein. 
And then lastly, so quaternary structure, not every protein will have this, but this will just sort of apply to proteins that are made up of multiple polypeptide chains. So for example, this is a very, you probably know what this is, this is hemoglobin. So that um, is consisting of four poly, um, polypeptide sort of subunits, I guess. So those are all how they sort of interact and sort of come together. That's your quaternary structure. And these are just held together through um, hydrogen bonds and dispersion forces. So relatively weak, but it holds together. So you can see that, so how they interact with each other. That's your quaternary structure. Um, yeah, and very briefly, probably, I won't, I don't want to trot on um, sort of Sonara's toes when she goes into genetics with you guys, but just briefly, the structure of nucleic acids. Um, so the sort of monomer in a nucleic acid is a mononucleotide. So you've probably seen this before. So there's sort of three sort of components in a mononucleotide. You've got your, your pentose sugar, which is attached to um, a nitrogenous base, and then on the other side, a phosphate group. So it's making that sort of, um, that shape with those three components. Um, and so a little bit of variation between DNA and RNA. So DNA, you've got your deoxyribose sugar, and in RNA, you've got your ribose sugar. So that's a point of difference. Um, yeah, so they're all sort of connected to each other. So you've got um, that phosphate group and those sugars are forming your sugar phosphate backbone. And then you've sort of got your nitrogen spaces coming off. Um, how the strands are arranged, so moving on to the left-hand side, they're in sort of an anti-parallel, -par sorry, direction. So they're going to be parallel to each other, but they're facing opposite directions. And then you've got that hydrogen bonding between those um, nitrogen spaces that are coming off the sugars. So they're gonna be bonding there and forming those rungs of that ladder, which we can see there. So you've got hydrogen bonding between adenine and thymine. So that's gonna be a double hydrogen bond and your cytosine and guanine, there's gonna be a triple hydrogen bond. So an easy way to remember adenine to thymine, cytosine to guanine is apples in the trees, cars in the garage. So that's how we learned how to remember um, which one bonds to which one. Yeah, so that's sort of forming that staircase. And just remembering in RNA, thymine gets replaced by uracil. So that's going to be in there and binding with adenine. But yeah, so you've got that DNA ladder and overall the structure is helical. So it forms a helix, um, which you're probably quite familiar with. Yeah, so that's all I wanted to really talk about. This is just energy value. So you'll probably need to, you might have to do some calculations to calculate energy contents of food or substances. So here they are. You don't have to memorize this, but it's good to know that fat has probably the highest energy content. And you'd be surprised, or maybe you wouldn't be, alcohol is kind of even more so having a higher energy content than your carbohydrates and proteins. Um, so good to remember that. Um, but yes, and I just have a, a slide at the end about acid-base chemistry. So I don't actually know whether you guys went into this because we didn't actually get it covered in our year. Um, but I just thought I'd touch on it so I can cover all the bases with you guys. This is pretty much all the relevant information that we at least needed. Um, yeah, just going to look at the chat. Uh, you can't, oh, you kind of did cover it. I, I'm very sorry if you went into a lot of detail with it. Um, this is all I really, we really learned about it. So um, unfortunately, I'm very sorry, I won't be able to sort of give you more information about acid-base chemistry. We kind of didn't get that lecture. Um, but so this is sort of my sort of limited knowledge that we kind of were, we had with it. Um, all we kind of knew was we just learned the normal pH and sort of what acidosis and alkalosis is. So at least I can give you some information about that. Um, so yeah, important to note the normal pH is 7.4. So in um, the normal, in the blood of a normal human, you're, you would be expecting a pH of 7.4. So then any deviation, so if you have a lower pH than 7.4, you would call the patient acidotic. So we don't say they're acidic, we say they're acidotic. So that's sort of the medical term. And if they have a blood pH that is greater than 7.4, then we would call them alkalotic. So that's when you have excess base in the blood. Um, yeah, so neutral pH is 6.8. I mean, it might be good to know, but I don't think it has any clinical relevance. Um, so um, probably more important to remember that um, 7.4 is a normal pH, and that's sort of how we gauge whether someone's acidotic or alkalotic. So that's probably the important point of it. So yeah, you can get, um, you can be acidotic or alkalotic for a number of reasons. So it can be sort of um, due to sort of the spiritual, respiratory, sorry, I've been talking for a while, respiratory acidosis or alkalosis, or it might be sort of to do with um, metabolic issues, 
So this can happen as a result of sort of, um, it can be due to medical conditions or it might be because you have some electrolyte imbalance or something that's impacting sort of the acidity in your blood. Or it might be sometimes even adverse effects of um, medications, things like that can result in acidosis and or, um, or alkalosis. Yeah, so respiratory acidosis is when too much carbon dioxide is building up in the body. So that's through with sort of your gas exchange. So you're having um, a buildup of CO2 in the body because not enough of it is being expelled when you're breathing. Um, and on the other hand, respiratory alkalosis is when there's insufficient CO2 in your bloodstream. Um, so you're not sort of taking enough CO2. So that can also happen. Um, yeah, and so metabolic acidosis is when your body cannot eliminate enough acid or it's eliminating too much of the acid, so you've kind of got an imbalance there. And then likewise with metabolic alkalosis, either your body is getting rid of too much acid or it can't eliminate enough of the bases, so that's also causing an imbalance. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, just thinking anything else that I wanted to talk about um yeah so or it might be interesting for you guys to know that sort of respiratory alkalosis at least um can be caused by hyperventilation so if you're hyperventilating you have an increased respiratory rate so that's going to result in an excessive sort of expulsion of co2 so you're getting rid of a lot of your co2 in the body so naturally um it's going to yeah so it's going to decrease the amount of carbon dioxide you have in your body and in your bloodstream uh so, sorry i'm just checking the chat once in a while. Oh, excellent. Okay, so you didn't learn as much. Um, okay, so that's good. So uh, I'm glad I'm covering stuff that you covered. So that's good. Yeah, so talking about going back to my sort of um, hyperventilation, so increased respiratory rate, you're sort of puffing out a lot of your CO2, so it, your um, carbon dioxide blood level is decreasing. So you have not enough in your body, so that's going to cause the levels in your blood to drop. So that's sort of what happens when you hyperventilate. So that can be a cause of respiratory alkalosis. Um, yeah, and that's also kind of commonly why, I don't know if you sort of noticed or seen in sort of cartoons and movies, you see that when people hyperventilate, you get them to sort of, well, they pull out like a paper bag and start breathing into the bag. So sort of the theory, I don't know how, how correct it is, but the theory behind that is that you're sort of rebreathing the air that you've exhaled. So all that CO2 is getting back into your body. Or well, ideally that's sort of the mechanism that they're sort of going with in that approach so that's that might be a helpful way to sort of remember um sort of why you get respiratory alkalosis and how that's sort of dealt with yes so yeah that's about as far as we sort of went with in terms of um acid-based chemistry but i thought that might be helpful to include so yeah i didn't really have much else after that so um that was everything really all that i wanted to get through so now we do have I think we have a little bit of time left. If anyone wants to ask questions or was there any questions that I missed in the chat? Anything along those lines? If anyone would like to ask, I'm checking the chat now. Um, so hyperventilation is caused by respir respiratory acidosis. I think it's respiratory alkalosis actually. So um, when you have decreased levels of carbon dioxide. So when you have a buildup of CO2, that's when your blood becomes more acidic. So carbon dioxide, having more of that will make your blood more acidic. And when you have less of that, it's making your blood more alkaline. Is that okay? Calculation for the body fluid question on slide 16. Yeah, sure, I can go through that. Uh, let's go back to slide 16. Um, this one. Yeah, is this the one? Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, sure, I'd be happy to go through this one. So, um, what is the osmolarity of three moles of AB? So AB being just any compound that is, oh, somebody, sorry, um, I will answer this one first and get back to you guys. Um, so the osmolarity of three moles of AB dissolved in one liter of water. So this is your compound AB, and we know that it has a dissociation constant of 0 0.5. So I've talked about this a little bit. Um, so your dissociation constant is, basically a percentage, or in this case a decimal, of how much of the compound will dissociate. So in this case, the molecule AB, 50% of that um, in the solution will dissociate. So break up into, um, I don't know, A plus, B minus. Just imagining it's like NACL. So A plus, B minus. 50% will break up um, and 
50% will stay together and just stay as AB in the solution. So that's what that is giving us information about. So if we think about your three moles, so then that means looking at the dissociation constant, 1.5 moles will dissociate and 1.5 moles will just stay as AB, so as just 1.5 moles. So now we're adding up the total number of sort of solute particles in the, um, the concentration. Yeah, okay. Um, so if we just, um, sorry, I lost my place. So um, counting up the total number of solutes. So um, the ones that just stay as AB, they're just gonna be 1.5 moles, yeah? Because we had 1.5 moles, they're not gonna dissociate. So we just have that 1.5 moles sitting there. Um, and as for the other 1.5 moles that dissociated, so that's going to split up into two, um, two molecules, I guess, um, each. So basically that 1.5 moles is going to double because that 1.5 moles will turn into 1.5 moles of A and then 1.5 moles of B. So what you're going to get is 1.5 moles of A plus 1.5 moles of B. So that's the dissociated AB and then plus another 1.5 moles of the non-dissociated AB. So in total, if we're adding up your osmoles, we've got 1.5 plus 1.5 plus 1.5, which is equal to 4.5 osmoles per litre. So there is no 4.5 osmoles per litre in the answers, but we do know that 4,500 milliosmoles is equal to um, 4.5 osmoles per litre. So the answer there would be C if I just... So the answer is C. I hope that made sense. Just let me know if you have any issues. So I think because of the time, um, I might have to get back to you guys. So what I'll do, I'm sorry, I don't have any more time to answer um, the questions that you have, but if you would like to email me. So my email is just, um, I have it on the last slide as well. So I have my email there. If you would like to send me an email with your question and I'd be happy to sort of chat to you after the lecture or whenever you've got time and explain to you anything that you were confused about. Is that okay are we happy with that thank you so much for your time um you guys did really well um yeah and just thanks for listening i hope i was helpful and i'm looking forward to meeting a lot of you in the future hopefully at some point no thanks worries. mindy that was an exceptional uh revision lecture thank you so much you again uh it'll be recorded and uh if you have any questions you can send them to Kavindi. uh up next we have a revision lecture on metabolism presented by Angie. So if Angie wants to share her screen. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'll just share it now. Hey guys. All right, great. Um, uh, I'll let you get started whenever and then I'll see you guys again at the end. All right. Okay, cool. how do I share my screen? Um. I think there's, if you look at the bottom, there should be the green share ah, screen button. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. All right. Okay. So I'm going to take you guys through metabolism, but I know that it's a pretty big topic. So I'll try and just highlight the main things, the high yield concepts. If you do have any questions that I haven't covered, feel free to email me. Um, and I've just put my email in there as well. So, as just a basic overview, this is what we're going to go through um, for the main topics. But we'll just start with a really brief review of coenzymes because they are very important for the topic of energy. We have um, a couple of main ones. I hope you guys all know by now, ATP is the energy currency of cells. And that's because it has those large three phosphate groups on the end, which can be broken up um, to release energy. And they cycle through the cells so that when we have a process that creates energy, they can take in that energy and store it in the bonds. And when we need energy, we can break them apart and release that energy. But another really important, or a couple of other really important coenzymes are the NAD, FADH coenzymes. And that's because they're used in the electron transport chain. So they're used in a lot of 
cellular processes and they accept electrons that will then be given off to the electron transport chain. And just another broad overview, we have digestion and mobilization as two ways of transporting energy and fuel molecules around. So firstly, digestion just refers to the food we're actually eating and breaking that down um, in the main digestive organs, so that's mouth, stomach, intestines, um, and liver is also very important, as well as the pancreas for producing enzymes. Then mobilization is when we use the stored molecules that we already have in our body and we can repackage them and send them through the bloodstream to different tissues for use. So we'll look at both of those in the different macromolecules and we'll start with carbohydrates. Um, so to start off, when you saw this in the previous lecture, we digest starch as the main carbohydrate source for humans. Um, we can't digest cellulose or the other carbohydrates, but um, the starch is broken down mainly in by amylase, which is the main enzyme. We have multiple types of amylase. We have salivary amylase, which breaks the alpha one to alpha four bonds. It's just a tiny piece of information, but I have seen multiple choice questions on it. And we also have gastric amylase or pancreatic amylase that can break it down in the stomach and intestines respectively. So remember that starch is a long molecule with branches as well. So we first just want to break it down into smaller molecules um, and disaturides. And once we have it in disaturides, we have spe the specific enzymes such as sucrase, maltase and lactase, which break it down into monosaturides. Um, monosaturides are very water soluble and they can travel into our cells through receptors. So we absorb most of them into our bloodstreams from the intestines. Once we have the singular glucose molecules, we can store them in different areas or we can use them for energy. So muscle cells can use them for energy or we could have them stored in a molecule called glycogen. This is also very branched and it's made in our cells. Um, and when we want to use up this glycogen, we use insulin, that's our main molecule for it, to, that signals to release glucose from this glycogen molecule. On the other hand, we have mobilization. So um, this is after we've stored it. Oh, sorry, insulin signals for glucose to be taken up and turned into glycogen. Um, mobilization is once we want to break that glycogen down and reuse it. So this might be long after we've had a meal and we need more glucose and we've run out of that blood glucose so we need a source for it and this source is glycogen in skeletal muscles we can break down the glycogen directly to glucose to be used in respiration or in the liver which is another the main organ for mobilization we can break it down into glucose 6-phosphate that we can release into the blood and that can travel around the body until it reaches its target tissue now, the hormone that signals for this is glucagon. So glucagon signals to break down this glycogen and release glucose. Um, a way of remembering them is that diabetics take insulin when they have a lot of sugar. So insulin is the one that signals for glucose to be taken away and made into glycogen. Um, where on the other hand, glycogen is the one that signals for uh, glucagon is the one that signals for glycogen to be broken down and released into the bloodstream. So now just a few what? distinctions. We have these three big processes, glycogenolysis, glycogenesis, and gluconeogenesis. And they can sound really similar, but if we just break them down into smaller words, we can see that they're basically, they are what they say they are. So glycogenolysis, lysis means the breakdown and glycogen refers to, well, just glycogen. Um, so it refers to breaking down glycogen into glucose. 
And I've just highlighted the main enzyme for this is glycogen phosphorylase. Then we have glycogenesis. Genesis means to create something. So glycogenesis is the creation of glycogen. And this is made from glucose molecules. Um, the main enzymes for these are glycogen synthase and also the branching enzyme, which makes the branches. I'll come back to them in one second. But first, let's also look at gluconeogenesis. So gluco refers to glucose, neo means new, and genesis, once again, is the creation. So this refers to the creation of glucose molecules from sources that weren't carbohydrates to start off with. And they can be things like lactate, amino acids, glycerol, acetone. Um, also important to note that the process of gluconeogenesis, so making glucose from other little molecules, isn't really just the same as doing glycolysis, but the opposite way. There are different enzymes involved in it. Oh yeah, let me just come back to um, the enzymes involved. So glycogen phosphorylase involved in glyconeogenesis, uh, in glycogenolysis, and the glycogen synthase in glycogenesis. So it's key to note that um, insulin and glucagon act on both of these enzymes, and that's how these processes are regulated. But um, in the case of glycogen phosphorylase, for example, when glucagon acts on it, it's simulated, but when insulin acts on it, it's inhibited. So that's why we get um, glycogen being broken down in the presence of glucagon, but it's not broken down in the presence of insulin. So we'll move on to glycolysis. Um, this is one of the first steps of cellular respiration and it's a pretty long process. There's 10 steps in it, but you don't need to know all of these steps. So there's two main stages and the most important things to know about it is that in the first stage, we actually need to use up ATP. And it's just a stage where we're preparing the glucose molecule into another six carbon molecule that can be broken down. The stage after that is the payoff stage. And here we produce four ATP. Um, and we also break down that six carbon molecule into two, three carbon molecules. Because we've only used up two ATP, but then we've gained four ATP, we can say that we've had a net gain of ATP. So it's still an ATP producing process. For the sake of multiple choice questions, what I would say is important to remember is that steps one and three use ATP and steps seven and 10 produce ATP. Also notice that we have the coenzyme NADH, which is also being produced. And by the end of it, we end up with two pyruvates. So if we don't have oxygen, we then go into fermentation. Um, and here we have our pyruvate molecules being converted to lactate. This, is, this occurs in the cytoplasm still when we don't have enough oxygen, so it doesn't move to the mitochondria. And we can notice that before in glycolysis, we had NADH being produced. But if you look at the process of turning pyruvate into lactate, NAD plus is actually produced. So in situations when we already have a high concentration of NADH, pyruvate will be turned into lactate to use up that NADH. But of course we know that lactate isn't really that good for us because it makes our muscles sore. So we need a way of to get rid of it and that's through the Cori cycle. I don't know how much you guys have done on it, but it's you don't need to remember the details of it just to know that it 
the purpose of it is to move the lactate back into the liver and turn it into glucose through gluconeogenesis because the muscle cells themselves can't actually turn lactate into glucose. So it has to be transported to the liver first. Okay, let's go back to if we do have oxygen and we want to do aerobic respiration. So now we've moved on into the mitochondria and before we actually go into the Krebs cycle, we want to convert our pyruvate molecule into an acetylcholate because that is what actually enters the Krebs cycle. And to do that, we have this little reaction called a link reaction. It doesn't create any ATP, but it does break down the three carbon pyruvate into a one, two carbon acetyl-CoA. So one carbon is released as carbon dioxide, and we also get an NADH out of it. Okay, now we can move on to the actual Krebs cycle. We have our acetyl-CoA and that's what moves into it. The Krebs cycle can look scary. There's a lot of steps, a lot of names, and a lot of enzymes involved, but once again, we don't need to know all of the steps. We just need to know things that could be relevant to us or um, the products of it. So here's a more simplistic looking Krebs cycle. And we can notice that, well, to start off, the very first step is combining acetyl-CoA with oxaloacetate, which is just a four carbon molecule. And together they form the citrate. Um, and by the end of this cycle, the oxaloacetate is recycled. So it's not actually used up by the cycle. Therefore, as we move our six carbon molecule throughout the cycle, we want to keep removing carbons and oxidizing it until it gets back to a four carbon intermediate. In the process of doing this, we get NADH, um, we get some ATP, but in this case, it's in the form of GTP. Guanine is just another base, so don't worry too much about the difference between them. They basically have... Now, for each one acetyl-CoA that we put through the cycle, we're going to get three NADHs, one FADH, and one GTP. But remember that for each glucose molecule, we had two pyruvates. Um, and therefore two acetyl -CoA is going through. So this is all happening in the mitochondrial matrix. And there's a few important things for us to know about it. You don't need to know all of the intermediates in it, but it might be important to know that some of them are amino acids, some of them are other metabolites, and they're not purely used for the Krebs cycle. Um, for example, oxaloacetate in itself can be used in gluconeogenesis and is actually very important for gluconeogenesis. So if our cells are very focused on creating more glucose, then there'll be less oxaloacetate left for the Krebs cycle itself. So the rate will slow down. Another important thing is that through the Krebs cycle, we produce more NADH. Um, and therefore we need that NAD plus. But if we don't have a lot of it present in the cell, if it was used in other reactions in the cell, then the rate of the Krebs cycle once again will decrease because it doesn't have enough of the molecules it needs to continue. So those are two ways in which the Krebs cycle might be impacted through other cellular interactions. Okay. And now we get to this final big payoff stage where we get most of our ATP, the oxidative phosphorylation. And it has two parts to it. It might look a little bit complex at first because there's a lot of enzymes and a lot of interactions going on here. But if we just split it off into smaller sections, we can see that it's not really that hard to remember. The first part of it is the electron transport side of it. And this is where we have all of our coenzymes unloading themselves and giving up their electrons into the membrane. 
So we start off in the first complex, complex one, that big purple one. And what that one does is that's where NADH goes and unloads its electron, gets changed back into NAD plus, and the energy of that reaction um, helps push a hydrogen ion through the cellular membrane, through that pump. We'll come back to those hydrogens. The next complex, complex two, is where we have FADH2 doing pretty much the same thing. It unloads its electrons into the complex, and the energy from that helps push another hydrogen ion in the next complex across into the intracellular space, so between the two membranes of the mitochondria. Now, both of these pass on their electrons to this other molecule called ubiquinone, and that passes it on to the third complex. So we can see that each molecule just kind of passes electrons across the membrane to a new protein, and that's how we get this transfer of electrons, so an electron transport. The final one that's also quite important is the cytochrome C oxidase, so the fourth complex. This is the final electron um, acceptor because once it reaches this stage, it will use the electrons to join onto oxygen and make water. And once again, the energy of an electron passing through it helps another hydrogen ion pass through the membrane. So the water is actually just a byproduct in this, and it will it can be used in a cell or be excreted. Um, but the important thing is that now we have this really high concentration of hydrogen ions in the intracellular membrane. Okay. Remember that things want to fall down their concentration gradient. So the hydrogen ions want to go back into the um, mitochondrial matrix. And they can do this through the ATP synthase pump. This is like a tiny little motor because the energy of a hydrogen ion falling down its concentration gradient and through it provides enough energy to convert ADP to ATP. So this is where we make most of our ATP at the end of respiration. So if we want to take a look at where we made our energy from again, these are the four main steps of cellular respiration from glucose. Uh, we started with the glucose, broke it down in glycolysis, and that made our 2 ATP. Then we had the link reaction to convert it to acetyl-CoA. That's in the mitochondrial matrix. It didn't make any ATP, but we got that 2 NADH. The Krebs cycle is where most of the NADH was made. And finally, we go into that electron transfer chain and the ATP synthase converting the energy from the hydrogens into ATP, and we get a large amount of it. So as a little guide, um, roughly for every NADH molecule, we get two ATP, 2.5 ATP molecules. And for each FADH2, we get 1.5 ATP molecules. So that's how we can work out these numbers. And we've seen that in total, we get about 32 ATP. Now in real life, this number does vary a little bit, but for the purpose of textbooks and multiple choice, that's a good number to go by. Are we all happy so far? Yeah? Okay. Um, so I'll just maybe skip these questions in the interest of time. But the answers are there, and I'll post, make sure to post the answers as well. But we'll move on to lipids, because this is a pretty big content. Uh, and we want to get enough time to go through it. So just a bit of revision, we have three main types of lipids and we can see that 
Two of them, the triglycerols and the phospholipids, are made of fatty acids as well as a glycerol molecule. So fatty acids are pretty important for our body and for metabolism. We can, they could be saturated, which means that there's no bonds in them, uh, no double bonds in them, or they can be unsaturated, which means they do have double bonds in them. And this double bond makes it have a little kink in its structure, so it actually bends it. And because there's a little kink, we can recognize which fatty acids are unsaturated because they're usually liquid at room temperature. We can make fatty acids in our body. However, there are a few that we can't make ourselves. And these are essential fatty acids. So they're polyunsaturated and we can't just synthesize them ourselves. Therefore, we need to get them in our diet. Two main types that you might have heard of were omega-3 and omega-6, which we get from fish oils. And they're pretty important precursors for cosinoids, which are kind of signaling molecule and also for cell membranes. But there are other types of fatty acids as well. So the way we get energy out of fatty acids. Um, in the previous lecture, you saw that fatty acids actually have a, or lipids in general, have a very high energy content. And that's because you produce a lot of NADH in this step, beta oxidation, as well as the Krebs cycle. So remember that acetyl-CoA is what actually enters the Krebs cycle, and we need to produce it from the fatty acids somehow. And we do this through beta oxidation. In this process, we slowly cleave off two carbons at a time from a long carbon chain, and those two carbons will be turned into acetyl-CoAs. So if we have a carbon chain that was 16 molecules long, for example, we would get eight acetyl-CoAs out of it. And for each step, when we're cleaving two carbons off, we also get one NADH and one FADH2. It's just important to remember that if we do have 16 carbon molecules, we actually only cleave off the two carbons seven times because the last time you would have been left with just two left over. So that's why a good way to remember it is however long your carbon molecule chain is, you will get one less um, NADH than you get acetyl-CoAs. Does that make sense? Okay, and all of these acetyl-CoAs can go into the Krebs cycle if we wanna produce energy. So on top of this process, we're getting even more, uh, even more energy at the end from the electron transport chain. Oh, I got a question. Um, oh, sorry. Yes, the NADH in the inbox is a typo. It's supposed to be NAD plus. I will fix that before I put the final slides up. Thanks for pointing that out. Okay, sometimes we want to make these fatty acids and they're mostly made in the liver's cytoplasm. So just as we broke down fatty acids into acetyl-CoAs, we can also make them up from acetyl-CoA, but in a slightly different process. There are many steps in this process, but the one that I'd like you guys to remember and take away is that once we create melanoil-CoA from acetyl-CoA, that's, that's it, that's the commitment. It will definitely be turned into a fatty acid. Because remember, the acetyl-CoA could either go into the Krebs cycle, it could be used to form ketones, it could be used to do many things in the cell, but melanoil-CoA, that's only used for fatty acid synthesis. So once we've converted it, it's definitely gonna become a fatty acid. Uh, once we have 
that starter molecule, we can continue adding acetyl-CoAs to it, so it increases by two carbons each time. And each time we add two carbons onto it, we need one ATP and one NADPH. So it is a ATP, an energy consuming step because we are creating something. Once we have our fatty acids, we can use them to create tricrystal or triacylglycerol. And this can occur both in liver and adipose tissue. But as you can see in the diagram, they start from different things. So in the liver, you get your glycerol and you can add fatty acids to them to create your triacylglycerols. But in your adipose tissue, you can get glucose and you have to break that down to create your glycerol. Don't worry too much about memorizing pathways. Um, the more important thing to know is that the creation of triglycerols are very important for the transport around the body. So fatty acids themselves, they're long carbon chains that are hydrophobic, so they won't dissolve in the blood, um, but they can pass through cell membranes. Once we create triacylglycerols, they're much larger molecules, they can't pass through the membranes, but they can be enclosed in lipoproteins and they can be transported through the blood. So before we move on to lipoproteins, let's just quickly mention cholesterol because that's another important lipid. Um, and we also can make it from acetyl-CoA. So as you can see, acetyl-CoA is a very major player in this whole metabolism thing. Cholesterol can be obtained from our diets, but we can also make it. Um, and it's important because it is a precursor for bile salts, many hormones, and also vitamin D. And it can also be used in cell membranes, if you remember from Free for Bio. One, probably, so there's a lot of steps. Don't worry about memorizing them all. But if you are to remember one, remember HMG. CoA reductase. That's the enzyme that is very crucial for acetyl-CoA being converted into cholesterol. So if we inhibit that enzyme, we won't be able to produce cholesterol. This is probably relevant as a doctor because we have a lot of um, HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, the statins, and they're the cholesterol lowering medications. You've probably heard of statins and you'll definitely come across them again this year. But now you can see where they act. Um, cholesterol synthesis is also regulated by hormones. So if we have insulin, it promotes the cholesterol sy synthesis. And if we have glucagon, it inhibits it. Um, they also act on the HMG-CoA reductase enzyme and they act on it to either inhibit it or promote it. But on top of that, if we already high, have a high level of cholesterol, it actually has its own negative feedback. So it will act on, its, on the enzyme to stop it from working. Okay. Just a very quick, brief talk about digestion. You guys can read through this as well, but when we digest long fatty chains, we want to break them out into smaller chains. And we can do this through lipase in the mouth and stomach. And on top of that, we have bile salts, which play a really key role in breaking down in the digestion of lipids because they take these big globs of lipids and they break it down into smaller globs and that's called emulsification. The smaller globs can then be broken down by enzymes and their fatty acids are released into the cells of the intestinal wall. Um, now once we have these fatty acids in that cell, they will be turned into triglycerol in the process that we saw before, and that triglycerol will all go into making a chylomicron. The chylomicron itself is actually too big to pass 
directly into the bloodstream, into capillaries, because they have very small gaps in between them. However, it can pass into the lymphatic system, because the lymphatic system has these things called lacteals, and they have much bigger gaps between them, which allow it to travel in. Remember that the lymphatic system eventually will drain into the venous system. So any color microns that go into the lymphatics will eventually get into the bloodstream as well. To store it, we mainly store fat in adipose tissue, fat tissue, until we need a source of energy, but we also store it in the liver. Um, much like how glycogen is broken down into glucose for energy and it's signaled for by glucagon, glucagon also tells our adipose tissue to release these fatty acids and triglycerides into the bloodstream so that we can use them. Because they're hydrophobic though, we need them to be bound to something. They can either be in the form of lipoproteins or they can be bound to uh, blood albumin and that just helps them, helps take them through the bloodstream to the different tissues where they can be used for energy. Okay, so now lipoproteins. We talked briefly about one of them, but Let's take a look at them as a whole. So lipoproteins are this kind of structure. It reminds you of a cellular membrane in that it has phospholipids on the outside of it. But on the inside of it, it's filled with these triglycerols or cholesterol esters, which are both very hydrophobic. So they have to be protected on the inside of the core from the very water environment of the bloodstream. On top of that, we also have proteins in this shell, which are called apoproteins. These are pretty important because they can be used to distinguish the different types of lipoproteins. You're not going to be asked to remember them, but you might be asked what the function of them is. So they can be used as ligands for different enzymes. They can be used to um, help the lipoproteins attach to receptors and they can be used as markers for the lipoproteins as well. Plus they also play a structural role in helping the lipoprotein be stabilized in the bloodstream. So we have four main types of lipoproteins and I'll let you read them in your own time, but mainly just know chylomicrons, they contain all your dietary lipids that we got from eating fatty foods. The rest of them are lipoproteins that are produced by our liver. And you can see that they decrease in size or they also increase in density. That's because when they have a lot of fatty acids, um, they aren't very dense at all whereas the smallest one, HDL, high density lipoprotein, it doesn't contain a lot of fatty acid, it doesn't contain any actually, but it has a high ratio of proteins in it. So as we go across these, they keep losing more and more fatty acids and therefore they start increasing in density. Now this is copy paste a diagram from the slides that we got in my year and it can look a little bit confusing, but there are three main pathways that are all described in this diagram. So we can break it down into the separate pathways. We start with the exogenous pathway. So this describes how we get fatty acids and cholesterols from sources outside our body because exo means outside. So we start in the very bottom corner with the chylomicrons being made from the intestinal cells, just as we described in digestion. They enter your lymph lacteals and then eventually drain into the blood vessels. Once they're in the bloodstream, they can travel around the body and they keep going until they reach one of their target tissues. Now, all of these tissues will have this receptor called lipoprotein lipase receptors. What lipoprotein lipase receptors do is they attach to the lipoprotein and they cut its triglycerols into free fatty acids, 
Remember, triglycerols are very large molecules and they can't cross cell membranes. Fatty acids are smaller molecules that are hydrophobic, so they can cross membranes. So this receptor is found on the outside of the cells. It helps produce free fatty acids from the contents of that lipoprotein, which can then enter cells such as skeletal muscles where can, they can be used for energy or adipose tissue where they could just be stored. Once this happens enough times, so what we get left over with is this little thing called a chylomicron remnant. That's no longer useful for us because it's given up most of its fatty acids. So it just travels back to liver where it attaches to another receptor, this time called an LDL receptor, and it's taken up by the liver where everything that it had inside it, such as the cholesterol it had left, is recycled. Let's talk a little bit about LDL receptors. So LDL receptors, as the name would suggest, take attach to LDLs and take them up into the cell. But it actually can also recognize the apoproteins on other lipoproteins, such as chylomicrons and VLDLs or IDLs. So it can, its main role is just to take up what's left over and take it back into the liver where it can be recycled. If you look at the diagram, you can see that when it's been taken up, the receptors are taken up with the protein as well, the lipoprotein. So the receptors can either get recycled and sent back to the cellular membrane or broken down. Another way of making the receptors is by producing them inside the cell. And there's a few things that regulate how much we have. I'd say this is pretty important to know how we regulate the synthesis of LDL receptors. So they work through a feedback loop where if we already have a high amount of cholesterol inside our cells, the synthesis of these receptors will be inhibited. But if we need more cholesterol, the synthesis will be increased. And if we have more of them on the cell membrane, then we'll be able to take in more lipoproteins, uh, attached to more lipoproteins. If this process doesn't work correctly, if there are issues, that's when we get diseases and in particular cardiovascular disease because we'll have all of this cholesterol in the bloodstream for example and not enough LDL receptors taking it inside the cell to be broken down or excreted and if we have a high level of cholesterol in our bloodstream it can lead to atherosclerosis but we'll come back to that in a minute let's go back to our pathways now we have a bunch of cholesterol inside our liver and we could excrete it, but we might want to repackage it and send it around the body again. We do this through VLDL lipo, um, lipoproteins. Uh, in this case, they're very low density. So they also contain a lot of triglycerols and fatty acids. And these are made by the liver itself. So they're made by the liver, they're excreted into the bloodstream, then they travel around the bloodstream much in the same way as chylomicrons until they reach the target tissue. They also bind to uh, LPL receptors again, just like the chylomicrons, and they release their fatty acids. In this case, as they start releasing more and more fatty acids, they decrease in density. So they become intermediate density lipoproteins, and eventually they become LDLs. By the time they've reached LDLs, they're mostly just made up of cholesterol esters on the inside and not so much triglycerols. The role of LDL is mainly just to transport cholesterol to different tissues or to give it back to the liver. So the completion of this pathway should end with the LDLs binding back to an LDL receptor on the liver and being taken up. What else might happen though, is if there's too many, they get taken up by macrophages instead. And when this happens, if the macrophage has a limit to how much it can digest, if the limit is reached, 
it will turn into a foam cell instead and become pretty much useless. But it's bad in a way because if we accumulate too many foam cells, they can lead to developing plaques on our arteries. So we need a way to make sure we don't have too much cholesterol in our body. And this is the third and final pathway in this whole process, which is called reverse cholesterol transport. This is where HDLs come in. Once again, it starts with the liver. The liver makes the HDL, releases it into the bloodstream, and that travels around. If it reaches a tissue that has too much cholesterol, the HDL can actually take up this cholesterol. Or if it reaches a foam cell or a macrophage, it can take up some of its cholesterol and relieve it of this excessive amount of cholesterol. There's one other little step that happens inside a HDL, which is that tissues will give out cholesterol, but the HDL actually transports it as cholesterol esters because these are much better to pack because they can be packed more densely in the middle of the HDL. So we have this enzyme called LCAT and it just converts cholesterol to cholesterol esters on the HDL. Once the HDL has filled up with enough cholesterol esters, it will be recognized by a receptor in the liver and it will be taken up. So the cholesterol that it has can be excreted or reused in the body. These tend to be known as the good cholesterol because it, the good life of proteins, because it takes up cholesterol, so it protects us from cardiovascular disease. Now, if you put those three pathways together again, we had the exogenous one, which dealt with all the lipids that we got from our diet, the endogenous one, which was reusing the stores of lipids that we had, and the reverse cholesterol transport, which was using HDLs to mop up this excess cholesterol, we get this whole pathway. And now, hopefully, it doesn't seem as intimidating anymore. And it looks very much like this diagram that we had before. Okay, a quick mention on atherosclerosis. There's a lot of research that can be done into this, but briefly to what's relevant for us is that once we have macrophages that have taken up too much lipoproteins, LDLs and cholesterol, they can't do their job anymore because they're so full and they have this kind of foamy appearance. So we call them foam cells. Over time, they can get lodged in the walls of arteries. And when we get too many of them, we get this plaque being built up. So it's this big kind of bulge that you see there that causes inflammation because we have cell death and it's a necrotic core. It's probably not good. As it builds up, the bigger it gets, the more it starts narrowing arteries. And eventually it can even rupture and release a thrombus. So this is why LDLs are related to cardiovascular disease because they, if we have too many LDLs, the macrophages will be turned into foam cells and HDLs are associated with lowering cardiovascular disease because they can take up some of those cholesterol and it lowers the burden on macrophages. Did we have any questions about that whole process? I know I spoke very fast, but you guys have the slides there if you want to look through them again, and you can always email me if something doesn't make sense. No questions? All right. You can ask me questions later as well, but we'll move on. We have more questions here for you guys to do. All right, we'll move on to proteins and amino acids. So you've already seen how an amino acid looks and normally it's not used as a source of fuel, but sometimes it can be. The way we can use it as a source of fuel, this is mainly just if, we're, if we run out of fatty acids and we run out of glucose, we can use proteins. The way we do that is we split off our amino acid by cleaving off that amino group and the carbon skeleton. Now the 
amino group that we had left over is just a molecule of ammonium and it's toxic to our body so we want to excrete it so to excrete it we need to get it to the liver on the other hand this carbon skeleton that we just had can now be used as a source of energy so depending on what our r group is we could either convert it into glucose with gluconeogenesis or we could just convert it into a ketone there are two words for you guys to learn here, and that's glucogenic and ketogenic. So glucogenic just means that this carbon skeleton will be made into glucose, and ketogenic means that this carbon skeleton will be made into a ketone. And both of those, both glucose and ketones, can be used by skeletal muscles, for example, as a form of energy. Let's take a look at what happens to the ammonium, though. But before that, let's just learn what transamination and deamination mean. So the two very important processes. Transamination is when we basically switch the amino group of an amino acid with a keto group of a keto acid. Um, it's called trans because it's a transfer of groups. Deamination is when we just remove an amino group. This is important in the glucose alanine cycle. What we're doing here is we are taking a amino group, we're transaminating it and adding it onto a pyruvate molecule. So why do we do that? Ammonium is not actually water soluble by itself and we want to transport it through the bloodstream. So the only way to do this is to create it into another molecule, for example, the amino acid aniline, and use that to transport it to the liver because only the liver itself can actually turn the amino group into urea so that it can be excreted. The muscles themselves can't do it. So if we turn this pyruvate, add the ammonium to it, create an amino acid aniline, and move it into the liver, it can then undergo the urea cycle. Now, the pyruvate itself actually isn't wasted because once it reaches the liver, we just remove this ammonium group off of it and excrete it, and the pyruvate itself can be recycled into glucose and sent back to the muscle. So the cycle just repeats and it doesn't actually use up or you lose any glucose. Therefore, it happens when we have very low blood glucose levels. To actually excrete the ammonia, we go through the urea cycle. So this happens in the liver. And because we want to excrete urea um, ammonium in our urine, in the kidneys, we need to make it water soluble first. So that's the purpose of the urea cycle. Don't worry about the steps, but know that it does use up a little bit of energy. It happens in the liver. And by the end of it, we produce urea, which is water soluble. Are we happy with the proteins? Did we have any questions about proteins? Okay, we'll move on to tissue metabolism or alcohol metabolism first. And this is just a brief, a few brief points about alcohol metabolism. There's two pathways in, this, in which this can occur in our cells. In a normal person, not an alcoholic, the main pathway will be the one with the green arrows, and it's in the liver. So there's two enzymes that we need to learn for this, and they're alcohol dehydrogenase and aldehyde dehydrogenase. Ethanol from the alcohol can be turned into acetaldehyde and eventually acetylcholate. We don't want to leave it as acetaldehyde though, because that's a very toxic molecule. So we want to turn it into acetyl-CoA, which as we know, can be used for so many things in the liver. Unfortunately, what we can also see is that when this process occurs, we start building up more NADH. Now keep that in mind, have a think about what might actually happen if we have too much NADH in our body. 
But there's also another pathway in which we can metabolize alcohol. And this happens in the mitochondria. It's called the mitochondrial ethanol oxidizing system. Big name, but this pathway actually only metabolizes 10% of the alcohol in a normal person. And it uses this other enzyme called CYP450 to break down ethanol into acetaldehyde. And then the rest, converting acetaldehyde into acetyl-CoA, is the same as the previous pathway. Now, why this pathway isn't the main pathway is because we actually produce a lot of reactive oxygen species when we use the MEOS pathway. And these aren't good to have as they can cause cellular damage, DNA damage in the body. And it's actually what le leads to liver cirrhosis. So if we look at all the effects of alcohol, we'll start with the buildup of NADH. Now, if we have too much NADH, we, want, we normally want to have a balance between NADH and NAD plus in our body. So if we have too much NADH, we want to convert it back to NAD+. If you guys remember, the fermentation of pyruvate actually converted the NADH back to NAD+. So in situations where we've just metabolized a lot of alcohol and we have a really large concentration of NADH, our pyruvates will want to produce lactic acid instead of acetyl-CoA even if we have oxygen. So lactic acid is favored. This is what leads to lactic acidosis and hypoglycemia as well, because all that pyruvate's been used up to make lactic acid. And that's why it's one of the things that we can see in patients who come in with alcohol overdose. Another one is its effects on the Krebs cycle. So once again, this is due to the metabolism of alcohol using up NAD plus and making NADH. The Krebs cycle itself also needed NAD plus. And since that was all used up, well, a lot of it was used up by the alcohol, the rate of the Krebs cycle will be slowed down. Also what happens is that this acetyl-CoA doesn't go into the Krebs cycle anymore but it still needs to be used somewhere. So instead, the liver will just convert it back into ketones and fatty acids. And this is why you see fatty livers in alcoholics, because we have all of this extra fatty acid in our liver due to that acetyl-CoA buildup. Lastly, a very important one for doctors is the enzyme that was used in the MEOS, cytochrome P450. Because not only is it used to metabolize alcohol, it's also used to metabolize various other drugs. And um, if we give a patient a medication that uses this enzyme, but then our patient just went and drank a lot of alcohol, the drug itself won't be metabolized because this enzyme is saturated with ethanol instead. On top of that, uh, as we said before, it releases a lot of reactive oxygen species. So that can actually destroy the cells around it in the hepatocytes. And it leads to liver damage in the form of chlorosis. Another interesting thing to note is that, as with enzymes in general, the more we use them, the more, our, if we have a high need for them, our body will want to produce more of them. So in chronic alcoholics, this enzyme, cytochrome P450, is actually found in larger amounts. So instead of the normal only 10% of alcohol being metabolized by it, we get much larger percentages and therefore much more of this bad effect of producing reactive oxygen species. So I'll have some more questions for you, but we have two more important things to go through. So we'll skip the questions for now. And feel free to message me at any time in the chat if I'm going too fast to slow down. But we'll move on to tissue metabolism. So we'll look at it in two cases. Firstly, the fed state is if you've eaten enough, so you have enough 
fatty acids, you have enough glucose, you don't have to worry about breaking, breaking down proteins for energy. In this case, the heart will mainly use fatty acids for energy because remember, they take a while to break down, but once you do, you produce a lot of energy out of them. It can also use glucose and ketones, but it will not do anaerobic respiration because the byproduct of that is lactic acid. And we definitely don't want to have lactic acid in our heart. So it's strictly only aerobic respiration in this. The heart can use all of these molecules for, yep, yeah, we have a question. Oh no, yeah. Um, okay, so the heart cannot store any of these molecules, but it will use them up. So it needs a constant supply through the bloodstream. The next one is skeletal muscles. So this can use aerobic or anaerobic respiration and it uses the same thing. So fatty acids when it's resting, but also glucose when it needs more energy. This one can also use creatine phosphate and that's when it gets bursts of energy because creatine phosphate is a little molecule and it just needs one step to produce ATP, but it will only produce one ATP. So it's not used frequently, but if you need a lot of energy very fast, that's what we wanna use. Now adipose tissue, it's made up, it's where we store all, all of our lipids. So while we've already, if we just ate, the main thing it will want to do is produce triglycerides to store them for later. The brain uses glucose and it needs a constant supply of glucose because it can't store it. But the only two molecules that can actually cross the blood brain barrier that can be used for fuel are glucose and ketones. So if we don't have a lot of glucose, the, it's pretty prioritized to go straight to the brain. The liver, um, when it is in a fed state, it's lipogenic. So that means it wants to make um, triglycerides and that will be used to store for later. And finally, red blood cells, just a special little mention because they don't actually have any organelles. So the only thing they can use is uh, glucose in anaerobic respiration. All right, let's look in the case of starvation. So in starvation, we don't have any fatty acids left and we're running out of glucose. Skeletal muscles, if they really haven't had any food for a long time, they can start breaking down their own proteins into amino acids in the process we saw before. So next is the adipose tissue. Uh, remember that in starvation, we want to take up our stores of fatty acids and turn them into something for energy. So glucagon is the hormone that does this and therefore we'll have a lot of glucagon present trying to tell the adipose tissue release this fatty acid so that we can use it for energy. The liver, it has a lot of things to do when we're in starvation because it wants to make sure that it produces some glucose for the brain to use. And if that's run out, then it wants to produce ketones for the brain to use. And it also is the actual organ that produces the ketones. But Interestingly, it's one of the last organs that actually gets a supply of these molecules itself because it's so busy producing fuel molecules to be transported in other places of the body, such as the heart and the brain, which we really need to survive. So the brain, if we run out of glucose, it relies on ketone bodies because they're the only other thing that can cross the blood brain barrier. Okay, and throughout the day, we have different ways that we get our glucose. So right after we eat a meal, we obviously get most of our glucose from that meal. So any extra that we have will be used to be stored. But that's important for in between meals. In between meals, we don't have as much blood glucose left from that meal, but we need it from somewhere. So we get it through the process of glycogenolysis. We're breaking down that glycogen to release glucose molecules into the bloodstream. Then if we don't eat for a long time, if we're fasting or if 
we're sleeping during the night when we have quite a lot of hours, hopefully, in which we don't eat, we go through gluconeogenesis. So in this case, that glycogen stores that we have have been used up and we want to produce glucose from other molecules such as acetyl-CoA. Now, just in the interest of time, I'll skip these questions, but they're there for you to go through after, just to make sure you've understood that. And we'll get to the very last thing, which is just the great metabolic rates. So in the great metabolic race, we're describing how we get our energy at different times during, say, a marathon. As we said before, when we're at rest, our main energy source is fatty acids because they are big. Even though they take a long time to break down, they give us a lot of energy. So they're very energy dense and we normally have a lot of them. But when we start running, we want to be able to get energy much faster. So in the first two minutes, we use anaerobic respiration because our body hasn't adjusted to this extra exercise and lack of oxygen but after about two or three minutes we start getting used to it and we can do aerobic respiration and we can see on the graph that in the first kind of five minutes here um can i draw it yeah in the first five minutes we have a very large steep increase of carbohydrate use now, slowly over time, we get more used to running, so our fats are being broken up again and used as energy. So we have an increasing percentage of fat use. And at around the 30 minute mark, this is where we have 50% of our energy coming from carbohydrates and 50% from fats. And after this, we go back to using fats mainly. But what happens when we run out? So if this is a really long marathon, we haven't eaten anything in eight hours. We run out of fatty acids. We run out of glucose. We need some other source of energy. And that's when proteins themselves start being broken down. So this is way off this little graph. Uh, and we've reached the state of starvation. The proteins are being broken down and converted into glucose and ketones for the brain to use. Then finally, if we want to actually have a sprint, the last couple of meters, we need a short burst of energy. This is perfect for creatine phosphate to come in because we don't have a lot of it, but when we do use it, we can use it very quickly to give us a lot of energy quite fast. So that's what we use for the very final sprint in this race. Then I have some questions about the race that you guys can go through just to make sure that you've understood it but maybe I'll just open up the chat now to if you have any questions before we finish up, because I know we're running low on time. If you have any questions or if any of the answers don't make sense, just send me an email and my email's right there. Yep. <coughs> the complex threes role? Oh, in the Krebs cycle. Um, yes, so um, you're referring to the electron transport chain or the Krebs cycle? Let me go back to it. Ah, oh, the electron transport chain. Okay, great. So uh, complex three role is once again, there's no, so the NADH went to complex one FADH went to complex two to release its electrons and they pass through complex three. Complex three is another proton pump. So it just pumps the hydrogen ions out of the mitochondrial matrix and into the intermitochondrial um, inter membrane space. Does that make sense? Okay, any other questions? Yes, the Krebs cycle is the same as the acetic acid cycle. They're just different names for the same process. 
think it's named after some guy called Krebs. All right, if that's all the questions we have now, I will make all right. post the slides with the answers as well onto the same Google Drive and you guys can have a go at the questions. Let me know how you go. Yeah. But good luck to everyone. Hope this makes a little bit more sense now. Thank you so much, Angie. <clears throat> that was a great presentation. Um, again, all the slides are, will be uploaded in the Mumus Drive. Um, I think I'll also post the recording of all the lectures by tomorrow night. And uh, I'll just leave on a quick note saying, I know it's a lot of content to absorb over two hours. So congratulations on the 29 of you who've made it through. And uh, don't stress too much over it right now. Uh, you'll, a lot of this content will get reviewed. And you'll also, uh, <clears throat> by the time you get to like second year and stuff like that, you'll understand a lot of it a lot better. And the first semester can be a bit slow, a bit rough, especially when you haven't met other people. So if you ever have any problems, feel free to contact me or <clears throat> anything. And uh, until then, I'll just close up this Zoom meeting and I'll hope you guys have a great Sunday. Um, also bookmark the Mimus drive. I'll post the link as well to that with the recording. All right. So later. Thank you guys so much.